How many of you have seen the movie 12 Years a Slave? Have any of you seen it yet? Yep. Uh, it's not the kind of movie that you're going to go, ooh, let's get some popcorn and run out and see that movie. I haven't seen it yet myself. Dave, it's a good movie? Yeah? I hear from everybody who's seen it and posted about it and everything that's pretty much a must-see, so I was going to go see it. But uh, in the Christian Century, I came across this article that says, New Film Prompts Calls for Racial Reconciliation. So, and this is a great article. But uh, I'm thinking out loud here. I read this last night, I went to bed, and literally had a dream about the church being interracial. And I recognized a lot of the people that I saw in the dream, and a lot of people I didn't. But it was a wonderful, it was, it was a wonderful vision, I guess you would say. So I'm holding on to that, and I'm still thinking out loud about it with you. Because what I'd like is for us to not only see that movie on our own as, okay, check that off the list, but I would like for us as a community with our friends in predominantly African-American communities to go see this together. Because we might not be able to be church together on a Sunday morning in the short run. It is what it is right now. But that doesn't mean that we can't be church together out there. So I want to see if, uh, how much longer this is going to be showing in our community and if we can find a day and time that would work for a lot of us to go see this together. So stay tuned for that. I think this would be a good opportunity for us. But along those lines also, um, I'm just going to set this here for now. I want to extend an invitation to you. Uh, our friend Ike Cooper, who was a longtime member of this church, charter member of this church, passed away not too long ago. And we remember her constantly. And her sister, Estine, has been a part of this family of faith and was with us at the building dedication on Sunday night. And as she was leaving with a few friends that she brought with her, she, she made it a point to, to invite me to um, her church, Allen Chapel, having fellowship. And uh, she said, I want you to come. It's the third Sunday of the month, so next Sunday, at 3 p.m. I want you to come and fellowship with us. This is, an, this is a verb that is used quite often in the African-American church. I want you to come and fellowship with us. So in asking her, so what does this mean? Are we going to come? Is this a potluck? She goes, no, 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 we're going we're to worship together. We're going to fellowship together. So I don't know how long this worship service is going to last. I don't know if it is going to start promptly at three or a few minutes thereafter. I don't know what we should wear. But I'm going, and I would invite you to join me. And we could even talk about carpooling over there. So this is kind of just stepping out on faith. I'm sharing this because you got to build relationship if we're going to do these things together. It's got to start somewhere. We don't have to sit down and have some big panel discussion conversation. We've got to have relationship. So next Sunday, 3 p.m., we're doing Allen. I'm going to Allen Chapel. would love for you to come with me. And maybe we can talk after the service about uh, getting carpool together if we want to do that. Stay tuned. Let's dream some dreams. This is a reading that comes from the Gospel of Mark. And this is not in the lectionary. Gene Fitzwater loves it when we go off the lectionary. <laughs> well, we'll see about that. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This is the word of God for the people of God. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Before we offer prayer, uh, we know our friends Paula and Wolfgang Vertigal. They got married in this place just this past February, and they moved to Germany just a few months ago to start their new life together, and we missed them terribly. But they have been keeping up with a few members of this church family through Skype, and they have been keeping up with the podcasts every week to be with us in community. And most recently, out of Andy Tag and Glenn Thurman's Bag of Tricks, we are on YouTube with the sermon. 
And so they like watching this. They like seeing us together, right? And so uh, they, they feel like they're with us in community. And so I wanted to be sure that in this medium, I shared news that Paula has green-lighted me to say, and that is that Paula is 16 weeks pregnant. And um, yeah, so, so there you go, Paula. <laughs> She's 16 weeks pre pregnant, and they're 99% sure that, that it's a boy. So Wolfgang and Paula are really excited, and we are pleased right there with them. Shall we pray? Gracious and loving God, on this day that we title Stewardship Sunday, let it be unlike any other that we would recognize the abundance with which you provide us, out of which we can draw abundant blessings. Let us understand today that out of that alleged poverty comes the wealth that can change the world. For it's in your name that we pray these things. Amen. <clears throat> Friday morning, my mom was up before the sun it's about 4.30 and she's walking to the street to get the paper. The newspaper's usually there by then, if you can believe it. But it wasn't there yet. And that was the point where the delivery person shows up. You've got a better chance of seeing Santa Claus than you do seeing your newspaper delivery person. I'm just telling you. And mom said that she had the rare opportunity of literally being handed the morning paper by a human being rather than having it magically appear on her front lawn. And so she took advantage of that opportunity. She and this person, they struck up a conversation. And the delivery person said, look, I'm really sorry that I was late this morning. Things have been a little bit chaotic lately. Mom said, don't worry about that. Don't give that a second thought. But then the delivery person said, I lost everything in the flood. You know, Austin had those terrible floods. I lost everything in the flood. I really need this job. I'm sorry I was late. All the news that my mom would read in that newspaper paled in comparison to the weight of a testimony that she received from a stranger whose life intersected with hers in relationship on her front lawn at 4.30 on a Friday morning. I lost everything in the flood. I really need this job. A flood certainly has the power to grab humanity by the shoulders and remind us of the things that are most important in life. The second Thessalonians passage that was read for us just a moment ago, it says, May God who reached out in love and surprised you with gifts of unending help and confidence put a fresh heart in you. That's the same thing that we have written on our pledge cards, our stewardship pledge cards. May God who reached out in love and surprised you with gifts of unending help and confidence put a fresh heart in you. A flood has the power to teach us about the gifts of God's unending help and confidence. Gifts that we often confuse with everyday luxuries and routines and ordinariness. Today we need a fresh heart. We need some discernment to help us recognize and to name and to claim those things in our lives that are truly God's gifts of unending, unending help and confidence rather than those things that are just distractions, you know. I've got a friend who's in AA. He's a recovering alcoholic and he enlightened me when he told me that in AA, recovering alcoholics view alcohol as a distraction. Well, all of us have distractions, and a lot of those distractions have the same level of control over us that alcohol has on an alcoholic. We just don't recognize it, and we need to. We need to recognize and name and claim those things in our lives that are truly God's gifts, and those things that are merely distractions. So here's our perspective. On the one hand, there's wealth. And on the other hand, there is poverty. The things in this life that lead us to believe that we are wealthy, the things in this life that we ascribe wealth to, those things, success in our jobs, 
advancing in our careers at a faster pace than our peers, making enough money to not have to rely on anyone else for help, having the most friends on Facebook, the most likes on Instagram, the most retweets on Twitter, knowing about the latest news, the latest trends, the latest hashtags before anybody else does, and even finding the perfect place to call a church home, to take pride in being a member of in this very church-driven community. Those things, those things are excellent at distracting us from our poverty. They distract us from the things that the world tells us are poor. Things like vulnerability, like being exposed for who we are and what it is that we're going through in life, like the delivery person at 4.30 on a Friday morning talking with a stranger on their route. Poverty is the compassion and the sympathy and the humility that we have in the face of our neighbor that we exercise seemingly at the expense of our own desires. Poverty. Poverty is embracing the reality of death. Poverty is embracing the reality of death as if death were something that we're supposed to run from, we're supposed to live in fear of. Those things are our poverty. Embracing death, compassion, humility, sympathy, vulnerability, those things are our poverty. Or so we are told, so we are led to believe, so we are tempted to consume. But beloved community, it's time to shake off Satan or evil or whatever you want to call those distractions and come out of that wilderness because it's out of our alleged poverty that the greatest abundance of God's gifts can be drawn. It's out of our alleged uh, poverty that we draw the true wealth of God's unending help and confidence. So our discernment this morning is between the distractions of wealth and the abundant blessings of our poverty. And to teach us this lesson in discernment, I want to tell you about my grandma B. Beatriz Castillo de Leon. As many of you know, my grandma B died over a, a little over a year ago while I was on sabbatical in Mexico. I was in Cuernavaca, and one of her dying wishes was that I come and offer the eulogy at her funeral. funeral. And so I, I went home, did the eulogy, turned around, went back to Cuernavaca. And I found my own ways to mourn as her grandson and not her preacher between then and now. But I tucked that eulogy away because I thought that when the time was right, I could share it with my church family because it has good news for us about our poverty. So bear with me as I share a few excerpts from that eulogy. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others because they gave out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty. It's the story of the widow's might. You ever heard it called that? It's the story of the widow's might. And it reminds me so much of my grandma B. For one thing, my grandmother was a widow for a long time. She outlived her husband, Macario Gomez de Leon, by 24 years. She was also poor for a long time. <laughs> but the reason why this scripture is so reminiscent of my grandmother is because of the lesson the poor widow teaches us. She teaches the lesson. And Jesus points it out when he tells his disciples, look, do you see that woman over there? She gets it. She understands that what we typically think of as wealth is worthless and that what we tend to label as poverty and disregard on that basis in our daily lives is worth anything, is worth more than anything else that we can measure. Now I'll tell you about my Uncle Mac. Uncle Mac is one of my Grandma B's five children. He was about 14 or 15 years old. He was working meager jobs, selling newspapers, bussing tables. His parents taught him about the importance of education and hard work, but one day he was just tired of working. All he wanted to do was knock off with his friends. They were going to go hang out, and they were going to go drink cherry coke. That was a big thing, going and having cherry cokes. But Mac didn't have any money. That wasn't going to stop him. 
His mom was working at the laundromat, making barely enough money to help her family get by. Mac knew how hard she worked. He knew how poor she was, how poor their family was. But when you're 14 or 15 years old and the world revolves around you and you want a cherry Coke, you want a cherry Coke. So he went to the laundromat and he said, Mom, the guys, they want to hang out. They're all having cherry Cokes. I really want one too. And so Mac says that his mother reached into her pocket and she pulled out two coins. And he said it was all the money that she had and she gave it to him. That was the best cherry Coke my Uncle Mac ever had because it taught him something and it teaches us something. See, my grandmother didn't have much, but whatever she had, she gave it to her children. Whatever gifts she had, even if it was only two coins, she gave it to others. All of it. Like the poor widow that Jesus noticed at the temple, Grandma B understood that what the world considers to be rich is merely a distraction. My grandmother would look at someone drooling over a big house and a nice car and fashionable clothes and an iPhone 5 with every app under the sun and a grande soy latte from Starbucks and she would say, that poor soul. Because Beatrice knew the truth. That the things that are worth the most in this life are simple gifts like family and laughter and protectiveness of one's children and community and friendship. And she knew that when you have that kind of wealth and you choose to withhold it from someone who really needs it, then it's to the detriment of the person in true need as well as to yourself. You both lose when you withhold. She knew that when you had that kind of wealth in your pocket that you gave it, you shared it, all of it. The poor widow that Jesus notices, she offers us the gift of discernment. She teaches us about the crucial difference between what the world thinks is rich and what truly is rich. What we think of as poverty is actually wealthier and more abundant and precious than anything in life. And here's the perspective for us at Friends Congregational Church. Let's bring this together. Since the establishment of this church's charter in 1978, this community has recognized vulnerability as a gift. And that's how this church has always been able to lean on the wealth of relationship with utmost faith, by recognizing vulnerability as a gift. This community is consistently focused on compassion and sympathy and humility in the face of our neighbor, and the results have been a habitat, house, a heifer project, a living wage initiative, an angel tree, a crop hunger walk, and a family promise ministry, to name a few of those things. This community has welcomed the reality of death instead of running from it. Embrace the reality of death instead of running from it. When the doors of this church were threatened with the possibility of closing, this community said, oh, whatever. And they put forward an open and affirming statement. And they witnessed the influx of God's people who came in response to that extravagant welcome. As one of this church's former pastors, Reverend Charles Stark, said on Sunday night at our building dedication service, that's resurrection. Out of all of that alleged poverty that the world writes off and runs from and is so scared of, out of all of that alleged poverty, Friends Congregational Church reaped blessings. You are those blessings. On the morning of our last worship service in this place, before we had to move out for the construction to take place, you remember there was a wall over there. You probably don't even, you probably can't even see it anymore, literally and figuratively. There was a wall right over there, and we knew that it was going to be demolished. And so on that last morning of worship service, it's not every day that you can write on the wall in church. So we did that. We wrote in huge letters on the wall, Offering God's extravagant welcome to all. Because that's the vision of the church, don't you know? And then across those letters and all around those letters, the children and youth and adults started writing all these other little things. The things that they wrote on that wall were the result of this church family giving out of its poverty for 34 years. 
Now, I know I've been accused of talking fast. I'm going to have to talk fast right now so that you can hear all of the things that were written on that wall. I made it a point to jot all those down before the wall came down. Here's what was written on that wall. Baptisms, godly play, no hate campaign, social justice class, food, the journey. Even vegans are welcomed. <laughs> Family promise, hanging of the greens, the church's website, Facebook, Earth Stewardship Covenant, open and affirming, lock-ins, one act of love at a time. A clean kitchen is next to godliness. Joy, donuts, barbecue, greeters, VBS, men's prayer breakfast, love is more powerful than hate, our new banners, all church retreat, open communion, theology on tap, morning manna, hugs, fabulous at any age, school kits and hygiene kits, new member classes, national youth event, 30 hour famine, circle of friends, passing of the peace, just peace institute, harmony, peace through music, greeters, Happy children, God loves all of us. Children's moments, trombones, church pantry, choir, prayer labyrinth, singing our faith, and a picture of the globe, and it says, too small for anything but love. Now, another 34 years from now, if we have to take down another wall for another expansion, another 34 years from now, what are we going to be able to write on that wall? Green justice, rain barrels, water conservation, solar panels, playground, community engagement, associate pastor. It all depends on how much we are willing to give out of our poverty. So one more story about Grandma B. My parents used to throw a Christmas Eve party that brought the whole family together, both sides of the family. It was great. One year, I was in charge of picking up Grandma B for the party. I was 18 or 19 at the time. And when I drove up, she was standing there waiting for me. So I got out of the car, and I opened the door for her. And she slowly got in and said, Gracias, mijo. And since I love charming my grandmother so much, I said, oh, well, it is my pleasure, Grandma. After all, I'm bringing the most important thing to the party. I've got La Reina. I've got the Queen. She'd love that. <laughs> she laughed and laughed. Out came the Kleenex to blot her tears of joy. I patted myself on the back and off we went. That was 20 years ago. Simple story. No big deal. But every time I went to visit my grandmother since then, whenever there were people around, and there were always people around, Whenever I went to visit her, she would bring up that story, and she'd tell everybody around her, you remember that time you picked me up? Daniel got me in the car, and he said, I've got the queen. And she'd laugh and laugh and laugh all over again, and we'd laugh right along with her as if we were hearing that story for the first time. Man, those were rich moments. We were the wealthiest people in the world. And what I've taken from that story about picking up La Reina for the Christmas Eve party is that while I thought that I was sharing a simple, charming jest, my grandmother received it as a huge gift. And she shared that gift with others topped with laughter and tears of joy over and over again for 20 years. What charming jest do you have? What simple gifts do you possess? What modest blessings do you own that you perhaps overlook or have yet to even notice in your own life? Don't be distracted from it. Look in the pockets of your soul. Where is your poverty? Fumble around in your pocket until you find your true gifts, and when you do, you will find your most priceless wealth. You will find God's gifts of unending help and confidence. And when you find that wealth, what, that wealth that you had previously disregarded as poverty, give thanks for it and share it. All of it. Because as we're often reminded, this world is now too small for anything but truth and too dangerous for anything but love. Last September, my grandmother's funeral, 
I said in that eulogy that Grandma B is the richest person I know. As Jesus reminds us, she has put more into the treasury than all the others. Today, beloved community, in your pockets there are gifts of unending help and confidence. And please understand, I'm not just talking about money we hear in your pockets and that's what we think about. In the pockets of your life, of your soul, there are gifts of unending help and confidence. And today, God is putting a fresh heart in you. So on this Stewardship Sunday, let's recognize and appreciate our unending help. Let's name and claim our confidence. And out of that alleged poverty, let's share the surprising gifts of God's abundance with one another. And we'll see what we write on that wall. Amen.